Two years ago, this channel began with a series of podcasts exploring populism and hegemony. During a couple of the episodes, points relating to the primacy of capitalism as a system to socialist strategy were touched on. They centred on the debate between Zizek and Laclau, and while I sided with Zizek, I felt that there was more to power than the compulsive nature driving capitalism as a system, that another driving logic existed through capitalism, but one that might also transcend it historically. The argument went that capitalism seemed more a tool of the powerful, a means to power rather than an end itself, that specific social hierarchies existed prior to capitalism, and while the bourgeois revolution sought to disrupt those social arrangements, and despite the less conservative wing of today's capitalists, it appears that through capitalism, those historic hierarchies are being reimagined. Leaving aside the initial revolutionary ruptures, capitalism and its rapid wealth creation acts as a continual social disruptor. It is this element that the left, historically and contemporaneously, wants to promote and preserve, the ability for continual opportunity and the limited rise and eventual collapse of power through state-fettered capitalism so that all may benefit from the system if they work hard enough. However, the right, it seems, are less interested in the disruptive qualities of capitalism, but the ability through it to accumulate and then sustain wealth and control by the dismantling of those fetters. Unfettered capitalism allows for the logic of capitalism to run its course, and this, as pointed out by Marx, is a contradictory logic. The left seeks to continually rejuvenate capital, using the power of the state to knock it back, correcting for its contradictory tendencies. The right, on the other hand, appear happy to allow this contradictory logic to reach its conclusion. This is peculiar because, of course, it's at this point Marx suggests that the proletariat, a class generated by the existence of capitalism and of a capitalist class, would seize the capitalist owns means of production as society degenerates on the back of its own systemic contradictions. Yet it seems that the power accumulated and concentrated by a narrowing capitalist class results in such that it might exist independent of that capitalist system. A class whose wealth and control is so endemic it resembles that of the aristocracy its founders once toppled. I argued that in principle, not only were the left-wing state interventions aimed at sustaining capitalism's socially disruptive characteristic unwelcome, but the capitalism whatsoever may be seen to threaten the power and wealth that has been amassed, as it allows others the opportunity to accumulate wealth and compete. So those with so much at stake seem to have employed the state to instead suppress the more general distribution of wealth and its distribution through public initiatives, as well as to implement successive periods of austerity, which have been coupled with capital strikes, which are like labour strikes except it's rich people withholding wealth from the system, as opposed to poor people withholding their labour. All of these factors have been commonplace since the left's post-war period of social democracy gave way to the rights period known as neoliberalism. It appears now bizarre that the institutions of this extremely wealthy class, their corporations, are reporting record profits despite very low economic growth and very little investment in production. This can be explained by financialization, rents and monopolistic acquisition. These reasons coupled with reports of brutal treatment of employees as well as that investment has at least remained present in the development of security technologies such as biometrics and big data collection and while public spending is continually reduced, the state is no smaller for its expanded military and policing functions. The picture painted is one where instead of verging toward the brink of a proletarian-led socialist revolution, we seem to be entering a new form of feudalism, with a new aristocracy that has little interest in investing in the reproduction of capitalism, and are happy to, and seemingly unaccountable for, the extraction of wealth through means that are not necessarily purely economic. But since these thoughts, I have read Imperialism, The Highest Stage of Capitalism by Lenin, and was surprised to read that many of these tendencies occurred at the turn of the 20th century and were described by Lenin as being a stage of capitalism, though he does claim it is indeed capitalism in decay. I was already aware that today's reducing growth resembled the reducing possibility of colonial acquisition of a century ago, as if land to be conquered was yesterday's markets to be conquered today. With reduced opportunity for the powerful to continue expanding, and as their fears of being dominated by competitors grow, they might instead turn to conflict, or competition among large powers rather than over smaller entities. This was Germany's reasoning, which led to the First World War. Having watched their powerful neighbours colonise much of the planet, leaving little for them, they decided to carve up Europe instead. And with that lesson, fears today that the powerful will soon turn to conflict have grown as the hope of economic growth dwindles. Despite this awareness, remaining separate from the neo-feudal imaginary just outlined, they are both addressed in Lenin's outline of imperialism from a little over a century ago. 
Not only that, but Lenin describes as characteristic of his period of imperialism a degree of financialization I would only have believed to have existed since the 80s of the past century, not the one before. And with that, let's get into it. Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Lenin argued that imperialism is a specific historical stage of capitalism, characterized by monopolies and a parasitic degenerative capitalism. The earlier stage of capitalism is characterized by free competition, but as is inevitable with competition, in which there must be winners and losers, this stage cannot last forever. If you're into football, it's like having the group stages of total competition and open opportunity, which eventually develops into the latter stages quarterfinals, semi-finals, finals and winners, from that open competition it is inevitable that the winners gain mastery over the others and eventually the power or capacity to win is narrowed from a generality to a few. Instead of football teams though, we're talking about wielders of capital who invest in the economy and collect more efficiently than their competitors the growth that is produced from such investments. From that generality of open competition, gaining mastery over competitors amounts to cornering market share. The greater a company's market share, the less space for competitors to operate and make profit in. Lenin argued that this supplanting of free competition by the monopoly form is the fundamental economic feature of imperialism, and this is how it relates directly to the outline of neo-feudalism described earlier. Powerful corporations making profits through monopoly and rents, parasitic practices on a once productive system, signifying that system in decay. Lenin states five occurrences that defines capitalism achieving the monopoly stage. First, from the chaos of competing capitals, cartels and trusts may form associations, something we're seeing today as talk among US and European governments of antitrust policy has re-emerged. Second, the monopoly over the economy by banks occurs. While the 20th century was the century of the US dollar, which rebuilt Europe and enticed developing countries during the Cold War, since the 80s, the degree of financialization of people's lives, whose reliance on credit led to much disaster during recent economic crashes, it's clear to see the determinacy banks hold over people's lives today is nearing total. Third, the manner in which monopolies can coordinate and seize sources of raw materials. The brute colonial acquisition of land over a century ago represents for Lenin this factor. This period coincided with an era of rapid globalization. And so, it has been with our era of globalization, neocolonialism and the financial dominance of the dollar ensures today that raw materials are procured cheaply for the imperial core. Fourth, the partitioning of world markets by cartels, though I know nothing about how this might be the case today in detail. Finally, Lenin spoke of the partitioning of the actual world by colonial powers, which, as he identified, was completed before the First World War. However, what we saw after the Second World War was a surge of sovereign national projects attempting across the world to break from that colonial situation through the logic espoused by the victorious powers of the war period and their United Nations initiative. However, those projects were all eventually faced with that financial colonialism already mentioned. And despite the war period breaking up the previously existing concentrations of capital, leading to the renewal of competitive capitalism, and then its inherent tendency once more to concentrate, we should not expect Lenin's treatment of imperialism to tell us precisely what is afoot today. Though in terms of developing a Marxist analysis of today's imperialist stage, and for those who consider Lenin's work a sound continuation of Engels and Marx, imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, can lay the basis at least for analysing what we are witnessing today. It had been my opinion that the increased financialization of people's lives was the result of the tendency of profits to fall, that our economy was gradually stagnating for a want to produce, and we were waiting the diffusion of a cutting edge technology through the consumer markets, as the smartphone had before, but is now waning. With this new technology, a new industry would arise and set everyone to work for a time, and in the meantime we'd be saved from the social unrest through access to cheap credit that would maintain our lifestyles. It dawned on me though that capital was now so powerful it needn't care about the plight of the working class, particularly that measures to stifle social unrest through both policy and technology have become so advanced if we ever were to rise we likely wouldn't know what hit us. Lenin's work reframes this moment in terms of capitalism, negating the need for fresh and wild theories, which is not to say we should treat theory from a century ago as dogma, but that from a Marxist perspective Lenin's work is a crucial point in analysing the present and developing the theory further based on this historic tradition. Without the experience of the century that has since passed, from Lenin's perspective as a Marxist, the decay of capitalism represented by its monopoly stage signalled the beginning of its transition to socialism. 
A reason characteristic of monopoly capitalism for this is the socialization of labor under the concentration of capital, whereby the means of production is collected under the successful competing capitals. The issue with capitalism is not that it existed at all as a negative and destructive force. After all, its dominance as a historic social system signals the end of feudal relations, and under its logic we developed collective forms of production from bit part artisanal manufacturers. The issue is that, once it achieves developments we might find socially favourable, it then fails to transfer the ownership of the means of production it develops to the producers of wealth, the working class. The issue therefore with capitalism is that under the relations of capitalist production, one class of society exploits another. It is from the yoke of this exploitation that we demand emancipation. If we were to, this shouldn't mean that we would then destroy the productive infrastructure developed under capitalism. If we were to seize the Amazon Corporation for instance, what great use we could put it to. Instead, we should utilise the elements of capitalism's productive infrastructure, the forms of socialised production, and develop them then from the novel perspective of the classless ownership. So while there exists material jumping off points developed during this decaying stage of capitalism that ought to signal to an organised section of the working class that the time was ripe to seize the means of production, instead, and in lieu of that organisation perhaps, are we witnessing the moment whereby the capitalist class consolidates its power, neglects the capital economy, suppresses the uprisings that would inevitably ensue from the towering rises in the cost of living and near total collapse in the ability to earn a living, and settles happily beyond the armed walls of their estates in parts of the planet least likely to be affected by climate change, who perhaps may help sustain the lives of the less fortunate nearby, as lords once did before capitalism. Though of course with automated production there would not exist an over need for this. Is this the society we're facing, or is this still capitalism? Lenin describes the point at which capitalism becomes imperial or monopoly capitalism as being when a few enterprises are left in respective markets after acquiring the others. They now have the power to also internalise once external markets or industries by acquiring enterprises in them too. At this point, having passed beyond the chaos of the earlier stage of open competition, the remaining enterprises may communicate and coordinate with one another. The enterprises socialise production despite themselves, though of course while production becomes social, appropriation of the wealth of production remains private. These private owners may still speak of free competition and of general social benefits of capitalism and commercial competition, such as lowering costs for consumers, but at this stage it's pure rhetoric, as they will have begun to fix prices, to leverage together in trust against competitors, coercively shutting them out of markets, to become so powerful as to control resources, labour, transport and trade. During this phase, commodity production as a base for the economy is undermined, with profits being made instead by financial manipulations, redirecting the benefits of the socialisation of production from society at large to speculators instead. Banks, who began as intermediaries in the flow of capital, facilitating the capital of someone who doesn't know what to do with it to reach the hands of those who do as credit, experience the same tendency through competition to concentrate resulting in the world's capital being channelled through a decreasing number of hands. Those hands that were left channelling the world's capital became inevitably incredibly powerful hands, getting to decide who would benefit from the access to wealth. Lenin highlighted that banks presented in form as the system's universal bookkeeping and distribution of the means of production on a social scale. However, in content, that distribution was private, not social. We can imagine the financial system as diffuse and unknowable, but when through monopolization a mere number of institutions come to have such a hold over it, we may identify clear moments of pure power. And with this power, industrial enterprise gives over to financialization. On the eve of the 20th century, the power of capital in general gave over to the dominance of financial capital, something it feels that has reoccurred of late with, as Harvey describes, the transition during the 20th century from accumulation of wealth through wage labour, or exploitation, to its accumulation through dispossession. In Lenin's depiction, banks came to own capital, while industrialists were left merely operating it. This monopolistic arrangement led to the taking of higher risks, the losses being palmed off on the public, and all this being hid by the system's complexity, displacing direct responsibility for the destruction of livelihoods and lives. This is certainly something most adults alive today have experience of. The owners of capital in this scenario, deigning not to operate it, are removed from industry and productivity. They become a rentier class in a financial oligarchy. Lenin describes the shift from the old form of capitalism that exported goods to the new monopoly form that exported capital itself. 
Where monopolies occurred initially between capitalists, they eventually formed between countries, where surplus capital accumulates. While the left would seek surplus capital to develop agriculture at home to benefit workers, capitalists, seeing no profit in this, are incentivized to protect their enterprises from others and so eventually tend to export their capital to less developed countries where capital is scarce and the means of production, resources and labor are cheap. This reveals a contradiction in capitalism. When capital over accumulates in a specific location, which is the inevitable result of the tendencies being described, it no longer finds it profitable to invest in what one might expect a rational economy to produce. Capital must be free to roam the world, which is why you'll see the free movement of people end before the free movement of capital when international social systems are stressed. The system prioritizes only one of these values. This tendency has once again occurred in the century that followed Lenin's work. Between the 30s and 50s of the 20th century, for various reasons, the left managed to circumvent capital through state-led initiatives such as the New Deal in the US, its Marshall Plan for the Reconstruction in Europe, and the Beverage Plan, Welfare System and NHS in the UK, and similar around Europe. Eventually, however, capital began to decline investment in Europe and US productive capacities and saw cheap labour and resource markets abroad in the tendency since the 80s to offshore industry and outsource labour. Lenin then turns to the carving up of markets and of the world by cartels, arguing against Kotsky's ultra-imperialism, where the cartels find themselves in a position to end competition. Kotsky's theory seems short-sighted as, while alliances may form a piece in considering the game theoretic, this piece is merely a matter of scale, and one that will shatter when a constituent of the trust identifies an advantage over the others. Today there is a peace among would-be geopolitical imperial competitors guaranteed by the mutually assured destruction of nuclear war. However, and considering Lenin's words, is there, under capitalism, any means of eliminating the disparity between the development of productive forces and the accumulation of capital on the one side, and the partition of colonies and spheres of influence by finance capital on the other side, other than war? Is this nuclear peace merely a matter of scale once more? Is it not inevitable that ways are being feverishly sought by today's powers to ensure their primacy in time? Lenin's words allude to the concentration in capitalism that renders the system entropic, in that its initial energy that sets it in motion inevitably dies. Once an entity expands, competition is free and easy, merely a matter of collecting as quickly as possible the diffusing elements found within the expanding field. However, when the energy that thrusts those elements into the expansion dwindles, and the elements begin to return home. Those having captured the most elements will turn to capture those with the least, and eventually, even if for a moment they rest heavily fattened upon one another, something will eventually budge, and the behemoths of capital will then turn on themselves. Lenin warned of the development within the imperial core of a labor aristocracy. This point does little to advance the exploration this essay is undertaking, and I planned to get this essay out many months ago, long before I noticed on social media a fierce and ongoing debate concerning the precise nature of the labour aristocracy. And with all the nuance we can expect of a fight on social media, one side argued that the working class of the imperial corps in total consisted of the labour aristocracy and were all to be damned, while the other side clunkily championed US patriotism in defence of the pursuit of speaking with ordinary workers who currently were clearly possessed of reactionary impulses. For what it is worth, my take on applying Lenin's conception of labour aristocracy today, I feel the opportunists he spoke of might be thought less so to be the ordinary yet reactionary elements of the working class who, to be fair, seem fairly anti-capitalist, just currently gripped by the inevitable forces of fascism that rise when capitalism is in crisis. The labour aristocracy might be more appropriately thought to be those who invest dogmatically in, for instance, the British Labour Party, where such an investment is part of one's identity rather than one based on material interests. While Lenin spoke about the limits of trade union leaders who were bought with the surpluses of imperial super profits and shaped their labour movements to suit the status quo and not for the emancipation of workers from capitalism, there does appear today to be a wealthy strata of the working class who will bleed their hearts in the letter columns of the Guardian, but in all honesty might secretly vote Tory as they scramble desperately to cross the line on their second mortgages for their buy-to-lets. Whatever about the reduced cost of living in the imperial core of Europe and US, thanks to super profits made from the exploitation of labour in the colonies, the working class in Europe and the US, reactionary and otherwise, are being decimated decade on decade for half a century now. I don't see the point in an international revolutionary communist damning them for not having yet developed class consciousness. 
Being unaware of one's material interests, I feel, is an altogether different thing to the opportunism Lenin spoke of when critiquing the labour aristocracy. To conclude then, and assess my half-baked neo-feudal theory in terms of Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. During the video two years ago, I asserted that the accumulation of wealth by dispossession was not capitalism, that it was, as the concept is based on Marx's theory of primitive accumulation, a brutal and not purely economic form of acquisition of wealth. However, from reading Lenin, it is clear that financialism, rentierism and parasitism are to be wholly expected as the contradictions of capitalism lead the system to eat itself alive. I was then under the impression that there existed some sort of capitalism in a classic sense, one perhaps described by Adam Smith, and that once it was no longer characterised by free competition and expanding growth, that it could no longer be thought of as capitalism. But of course, examining today's situation in the historic tradition of Marxism, this is simply capitalism at its highest stage, where Lenin optimistically declares that the socialisation of labour and production has been achieved and the steps towards socialism are underway. My theory claimed that capitalism was a tool wielded by the powerful for the consolidation of that power, and their capital strikes, their withdrawal from investment and interest in reproducing and expanding capital was a sign that they were no longer capitalists, and that capitalism could no longer be considered as characterising our system. However, as Lenin describes it, this situation does characterise monopoly capital, particularly finance capital, whereby that powerful class are operating under new rules of the game. Wealth is just accumulated through financial rather than industrial means. The record profits we see companies make today despite generating little to no wealth in the Marxist sense is not due to capitalism having passed, but due to its lingering death, as that class parasitically feeds off it though it is at least true it is no longer interested in the productive economy. So, if there is no economic growth forecast, I asked, what is happening with the capitalists? They formed financial monopolies and are extracting wealth through rents, Lenin answers. They will eventually reconcile this lack of growth through war, he suggests, though without knowledge of the atomic bomb. Is Bezos still a capitalist even though it seems he's accumulating wealth through extra economic means? Is he a feudal lord? Of course, he is a monopolist likely involved in a technological cartel currying favour with financial institutions to continually increase stock prices to keep board members happy, and the impression that the enterprise is productive and profitable is a mere smokescreen concealing the oppression of financial imperialism sucking any traces of actual wealth under its dominion through privatisation of public wealth, austerity and the indebtedness of the consumer class, not to mention through rents on the operations of capital in the colonies. Despite what Lenin could teach us about those questions, I remain puzzled by the material implications of the continuation of these trends. As above, Lenin sees in this development the socialisation of production. It is merely a matter of a well-organised section of the proletariat with the correct policy to emancipate the working class from capitalism to appropriate the privately owned means of production and in so doing, socialise the ownership of its already socialised form. However, the century since his work has been an unexpected prolongation of and continual adaptation by capital. During the social democratic era, the working class was treated to a cultural offer that has never been seen and may never be seen again. With this cultural offer, the ability to interpret class interests has been diminished. The path to class consciousness seems obfuscated, and since even the solidarity that prevailed during the social democratic period underpinning the welfare state has been eroded under the influence of neoliberal dogma, where the working class from its plump, oblivious years of steady jobs and rising incomes has become resentful, suspicious, mean and increasingly disenfranchised. It would appear that what we call crises of capital are perfectly functional and convenient cycles under monopoly capitalism, death throes during which opportunities to accumulate more wealth by the capitalist class are rendered. The class interests of the workers in the imperial core are once more becoming painfully felt. Yet still, so many are quick to listen to capital and consume the prefabricated antagonisms with migrant workers, trans folk and those of different races, with whomever other than those operating the conditions of their material malaise. It appears today, unlike a century ago, the class consciousness and awareness of our interests necessary to take advantage of the socialisation of production of monopoly capitalism is out of reach, and the moment may pass us by. If this is the case, then what do we face as this monopoly power consolidates further, as capitalism continues to die, as the economy comes to no longer hold any function for power? Will production, for those who can afford it, those who own the means of automated production, result in direct consumption? Will we achieve a zero growth economy, where the powerful few will possess everything and those who manage to survive such an upheaval will be left to fend for themselves on the outskirts of the pockets of environmentally viable patches of the planet? 
or will we organize and struggle for the emancipation of the working class from capitalism and simply appropriate and socialize the ownership over the already socialized monopolized means of production